Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Bill Knauer. He is the author of several books on writing, including Fearless Writing, How to Create Boldly and Write with Confidence. He's also the author of a book called Everyone Has What It Takes, A Writer's Guide to the End of Self-Doubt, as well as a book titled Write Within Yourself, An Author's Companion. Bill Knauer, welcome to the program. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Doing well, you know, um, we're hitting on a topic that is so universal, fear, yeah. performance yeah. anxiety, fear of writing, yeah. fear of the blank page, fear of not yeah. living up to other people's standards or our own standard uh, for that matter. Yeah. This sure. has really been your channel. To, how did you get started with this? I mean, why? What, what was it that kind of triggered in you this realization that this is a huge issue for writers and you really kind of made it your campaign? Well, I think it was just from personal experience in that I had, I had somebody who was, I was somebody who um, really was a devotee of craft and applied myself from a very early age to that and learned it and learned it and I once I found a story recently that I wrote when I was 19 or something, and I got to say it was pretty good. I mean, I already had figured a bunch of things out, but none of that helped me. I didn't take seriously the emotional mastery, and I had really no success um, in for a long time. And this was confounding to me. Because I really had no plan B. It was just writing. And so I was waiting tables and just doing the thing, you know. And this was going on a long time. And so I was pretty unhappy in general. And so this caused me to get interested in, like, how I get in my own way with just anything. I mean, it was specific to writing. But I got very interested in the emotional challenges of writing. And I really saw that it, that it was just the emotional challenges of being human and what we pay attention to and what we think. And I gradually understood that it, it was the emotional challenges of writing that really got in most people's way. It had less to do with the craft and the business of writing. I mean, you have to learn all that, but the real mastery comes with the emotional challenges. And so I started learning from some spiritual teachers that I got kind of interested in. And I just thought some of these principles really apply to writing and I just sort of learned my own principles. And I just got very interested in how to help writers think about themselves beyond craft, that they're learning, that that was really just the beginning. That who, they were really learning the, how- Who are some of the spiritual teachers? Uh, it varied, I was very into, uh, still, uh, a good big fan, I guess you could say, of uh, some someone called uh, Esther Hicks or Abraham Hicks. They're very popular, probably one of the top spiritual teachers. I thought Eckhart Tolle did some great stuff. I mm -hmm. I was a fan of a book called A Course in Miracles. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Anything anything that really looked into the role your thoughts played in your life, you know, just the, that and paying attention to your thinking. And seeing life as something that you create rather than something that happens to you, which to me is absolutely germane to writing. Because when you sit down to write, you, nothing can happen to you. <laughs> it's just you in the blank page. Nothing happens until you make a choice. Yeah, you're not at real and, risk. You're not really at risk, even though we feel at risk. But also, well, wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't you agree that some people approach writing, or certainly writing can be approached as a spiritual practice? Oh, that's I teach it. That's a, actually a class I teach, <laughs> writing as a spiritual practice. Tell us and more I, about once that. I began, well, once I began to understand what was happening when I wrote, um, I saw it as a spiritual practice, by which I mean it was a practice of dealing with the non-physical. Your thoughts, primarily your thoughts and emotions, first of all, just on the most basic level. 
In other words, you had to focus your attention on the kind of thoughts you wanted in order to create. On a very basic level, you need to kind of, you have to focus on, if you want to write about war, you have to think about war, right? I mean, that's just the most basic level. But you also can't sit there and think, I'm no good, and write. And you can't sit there and think, no one wants this, and write, or there's no market for it, and write. So that was the beginning. But then there was also just the fact that, if I'm honest, I am just allowing something in. I am making room for inspiration. I I can't really manufacture a good idea, but I can put myself into a frame of mind where a good idea can come to me. You know, I interviewed the author James Lee Burke. Are you familiar with him? He's a oh, yeah. suspense writer, kind of, kind of legendary. And I, I will never forget this. This is in everyone has what it takes, but... We're, I, so I can kind of tell whether people outline or not. I don't outline, but I, I don't, there's no one right way to do it. If you outline, great. If you don't, that's fine, too. But I knew in one paragraph that James Lee Burke was not an outliner just based on the language that he used. And so I, I didn't know it for sure, but I, at the beginning of our interview, we said, I said, hey, James, you don't outline, do you? He goes, no, no, I don't outline. I know it's in the first time, but after that, I'm just going. He said, look, look. He's 83 at this point. He's written, I don't know how many books. You know, he is an old grizzled veteran. He said, look, you better make peace with whatever God you pray to. Because if you think you do this on your own, forget it. It's over. And I said, you know what, James? I got to agree with you. I don't know how to do this on my own. Whether you call it the muse or you call it God or source energy, whatever it is, I began, I saw writing as a relationship with something. And I had a role to play. Does that make sense? Yes. It does. It makes yeah, sense to me. I do, I've done a lot of spiritual reading in my life, and still do. And and yeah. the whole act of writing, it, it, what was actually kind of organic with me, it just I started to realize that one of the ways I treated my fear of writing was to was to remove myself from it, to try to be more of a channel and not yeah. feel that I'm the creator of what I'm writing, but rather that I'm channeling it. Uh, yeah. And that yeah. kind of alleviates, it doesn't make it disappear completely for me. It's still difficult, uh, especially if I end up taking a break from writing to get back to it. But um, it's just, as I said at the top, uh, Bill, it's so universal, the, the fear. Now, I know you have interviewed people like Nora Ephron and, mm -hmm. uh, well, James Lee Burke, Amy Tan, William Gibson. Are these yeah. people devoid of fear, or do they still? Did you get into oh, the subject? Oh. Or do they still fear the page? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's all different. You know, they. Have to, I remember Amy Tan was like, you know, you get to you get to the level she's at, and she said, you know, people offer a lot of money for her books, and that sounds great, which it is. But then that's pressure. Then you have expectations, and you have to forget about all that. When you sit down, you can't think about your publisher, can't think about your family, can't think of about your readers. So, no, they're not devoid of fear. I think that the difference between the professional writer and people starting out is that they've learned what to do, how to how to sit down and go to that fearless. Look, I wrote a book called Fearless Writing. Writing, if you're actually writing and you're in that zone that I if you write, Mike, then you've been in the zone where you forget what time it is and you forget about the world outside your window and all your attention's on the story and it's more real than anything else and you're in that flow state and stuff is coming to you and you're surprised, right? You've been in that state, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Everyone who, if your audience are writers, then they've been in that state too. There is no reason to write and if you've never been in that state, it's just, it's the, it's the reason we actually do it. Well, that state is a fearless state. If you want to know what fearlessness is, that's it. And the only question is, so all writing is inherently fearless, period, full stop. But the question is, are you going to be fearless on purpose or are you going to do it, just leave it up to some capricious muse? And so I've made it my part of my work is to help people do it on purpose. I want to do it on purpose. And so that's what fearless writing is about, that practice of getting into that state um, on purpose, as opposed to say, well, it went well today. Mm -mm. I think there's a way to do it deliberately. And it also do with your mind, 
It all has to do with your mind and what you're thinking about while you're writing. So you brought up an, it's uh, not, you brought up an interesting point earlier, which has to do with, you know, you write a hit novel like Amy Tan did. Uh, her first novel mm -hmm. was a sensation. Um, and yeah. then there's pressure. And, you know, in the music industry, they talk about how you you have your whole life to write your first album and six months to write your right. second one. And it's the <laughs> same, right. it's, it's the same right. with, with uh, writing, though. I mean, if you hit, yeah. then the yeah. publishing house, your yeah. agent, the publishing house wants you to turn out, look, it was hot, turn out another one. Uh, it builds sure. the pressure. Pressure's not exactly the best. Um, it's not conducive to creativity, <laughs> for sure. Not for most people. Not for most people. Can there are some see, people who don't you use see, it as a motivation, but... It could be that. It could be that. But yeah, you see people yeah. who come out with a smash novel, their debut novel. Mm -hmm. And then after that, yeah. in fact, I don't know. Uh, I thought Bright Light's Big City by oh, yeah. Jay remember was spectacular. Yeah. And I don't think anything's yeah. come even close since then. And I don't mean to, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to dish on Jay McInerney, but uh, right. that was a revelation when I read it. It was a long time ago, and yeah. that was a revelation yeah. for me. But yep. the pressure that probably was was upon him and, you know, may, maybe that was his. I just think that, you know, just ba basically sticking with what you were saying earlier, that um, um, it does really create a lot of expectation of yourself and right. from the market. Yes. And, and I think that pressure is, <clears throat> excuse me, pressure is a consequence of our attention we think it's like a you know you feel it's a kind of like a almost a physical thing like if somebody's pushing on you you're feeling pressure but in fact we always create our own pressure and even if someone says we really want this book to do well that's fine but it's up to you as to whether you're going to allow that to be a thing to to that'll weigh on your mind of trying to meet their expectations fear the fear every writer faces because I, you know, I, I have this podcast called Author to Author. I have a, I edit a magazine called Author Magazine that I, where I interview a lot of writers. And the thing, the reason I call it author is I'm interested in the relationship between how a person creates something with the awareness they're going to share it with other with other people, because that's where the problem starts. And the number one fear all writers face is what other people think of my stuff is more important than what I think of my stuff. That other, what other people think your stuff is the ultimate measure of its value. And so pressure is how do I write something that will be as popular as the last thing I wrote? Well, nobody knows how to do that. Nobody. Mm -hmm. If everybody knew how to do it, they just do it. Now you might get into a rhythm where you find a kind of book that seems to resonate with your readers and you're able to do it on a regular basis. But if you're doing like literary fiction, like Jay McInerney, McInerney did, he can't just repeat that. He has to find something new each time. And so the thing every writer has to do when they sit down to write is forget about the reader in the, in the sense of what they will like or not. You have to remember them in terms of translating your ideas so that somebody else could possibly, who isn't inside your head, can appreciate them. But you can't think about them. You can't think about the market. You can't think about your editor, your agent. Can't think about any all of that is stuff you have no control over. All you can do is focus on the story that that excites you the most, that turns you on, that, that generates, that has your full attention, and follow it and trust it'll take you somewhere. Well, and that's, that's all you can do. That's more. I mean, I've had people on the program who said I write for myself because I I don't think about the market. I want to write what I want to write. And then it's up to the market to decide whether it likes it or not. But it makes the writing yeah. more authentic because it's really who you are rather than, than trying right. to sound like a novelist or sound or channel right. some particular you know, uh, Ernest Hemingway or whoever. Right, right. How For do sure. we achieve fearless writing? That That's your signature book, I would say. And that's your signature phrase is fearless writing. Uh, from it's what one I of know. them. Yeah, would, it's a practice. So here's the thing. It's a practice. It's not a point on a grid. And the practice is when you sit down, I mean, the simplest practice is when you sit down, pay attention to, notice your attention. Anytime, anytime you begin to think about anything other than the story you want to tell, you will be afraid. Uh, I, when I wrote Fearless Writing, I came to understand that um, all fear, all fear is a story about the future. And it could be a minute from now or a year from now. And when people read your stuff, that's in the future. 
So your job is to be present. So you show up to the page and you cannot think about what other people will think about it. You can't think, is it any good or not? You can't think, will there be a market for this? You can't think, is this too literary? All you can ask yourself, this is one of the tools from the book, is two questions. What do I want to say? What's the story I'm interested in? What should happen next? What do I, I phrase it as, what do I want to say? But what's the story you want to tell? So what do I want to say? That's part one. And have I said it? And so so you, in that way, it's like part, meditation. It's, it's staying exactly. riveted to the mantra, uh, well, the mantra being the story you're well, telling. If your thoughts drift, uh, well, that's, you have to keep pulling thoughts, it That's right. It is very much like meditation. And if your thoughts drift to what other people think, it's over, but you can call your thoughts back. The nice thing about any time your thoughts drift to what other people will think, you will feel afraid, you will feel nervous, you may feel hopeless, you will feel uh, sort of like an instant failure, kind of, because you can't answer the question, I wonder if they'll like it, you don't know. The only thing you know is that if you like something, and whether you have translated that idea onto the page into words. And a lot of times the answer to the second question, is this what I meant to say? Is this as cool as I thought, interesting as I thought, profound as I thought? Sometimes the answer is no, but that's okay. You go back and rewrite it, but only you can answer that question. But what you don't ask when you look at the page is, is this any good? You never ask that. Because what whether is this thing any good is simply code for what will other people think of it. Well, other people think it's good. You can't answer it. You can't care about that. You just can ask yourself, is this it? Does this float my boat? Is this what I want it to be? Is this what I consider a satisfying sentence, paragraph, scene, chapter, story? Does this satisfy me? This is something I've been on lately, though, Mike. Admitting you have an aesthetic. Admitting you have your own unique aesthetic and saying to yourself of your work, does this satisfy my aesthetic? Not the market's aesthetic, not my MFA professor's aesthetic, not my writing group's aesthetic, mine. Because you have one. If you've been reading for a while or writing for a while, there's things you like and things you don't. And somewhere in you is your own unique aesthetic. Embrace it. Admit it. And say that the only one you're trying to satisfy is you because you're the only one whose aesthetic you fully understand. So that should be the question. If I met my own idea of what makes a cool story, a funny story, an interesting story, whatever it is, you know, I write about my own life, so I don't write fiction anymore. Uh, maybe I'll go back to it. I don't know. But right now it's not in the future. But I have my idea of what an essay is, a memoir is, or an uh, inspirational book is. You know, I have my own aesthetic. Speaking of memoirs, uh, and this yeah. is along the lines of what you're – oh, yeah, let, let me make this point that – it's not just your attention drifts and you start to think about the market or your agent or the publishing house, but also just thinking about, I need to fix something in the house, or I should really run this oh, yeah, over, yeah. I, need to, <laughs> I need to make right. a, a run to the grocery store. Sure. And sure. along that line, Russell Baker, who wrote, I think yeah. it won the Pulitzer Prize growing up, his memoir yeah. called Growing Up, yeah. is one of two memoirs yeah. he wrote. And I remember in there he was writing about how he was thinking in terms of that he wanted to be a novelist. He wanted to write a novel. He, but right. he, every time right. he would sit down, he said he would feel exhausted and he would think, I'm too tired to write. <laughs> and he said, and as soon as I set the writing aside, just decide, well, I'm not going to do that today because I'm too tired. He was full of energy and he was ready to do right. other things. So just the act right. of writing, not it depleted his energy. It was a it was a task that he really didn't want to face. And. And I've had that see, experience just, myself many times. See, I, I don't agree with that interpretation uh, of his exhaustion. I suspect because he wasn't a novelist. I mean, Russell Baker wrote, he had a great column from the New York Times and he mm -hmm. wrote memoirs. But I don't even think he wrote fiction, did he? No, no, but he, he was right. thinking in terms of doing that. But, right. but he of failed course, at it for that, that reason. But, and, well, because it wasn't what he was meant to do. He was working against the current of his own desire of who he was as a creative person. His true attention, his most effortless expression was the personal essay, the memoir, the vignette. That's what he was sort of meant to do. But he was trying to make himself do something he wasn't actually fully interested in doing. Mm -hmm. So he was working. His, he was exhausted because he was working against a headwind. But as soon as I'm sure he turned his attention to the kind of stuff he wrote for the Times or his memoir, I bet he wasn't exhausted because he wasn't working against himself. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's an excellent point. 
Now, let me ask you this. So another title to, to one of your other books is called Right Within Yourself. And you may have already addressed what that means because you've been talking about some of these, the, the mechanics and the, the thought processes and all. Uh, how would yeah. you define writing within yourself? You know, that book was published before Fearless Writing. So it was sort of, um, I was mulling over the ideas, I think, of Fearless Writing, meaning don't let your attention get outside of yourself. Don't go outside. Don't go. Everything that you write happens within yourself. So don't let your attention drift to, again, the market, the rear reader, the editor what other people want. Keep your attention within yourself, which is where the story resides, which is where the um, where your imagination resides, where your desire resides. Keep it there. Because the thing about writing is if, if you do share it. Like, you know, if you write something, if you want to have a career at it, someone's got to like it, right? <laughs> somebody, whether you publish traditionally or you're independently published, somebody's got to like your stuff. So whether people like your stuff or not seems incredibly important. But the truth is, while yes, ultimately you do need to find someone who likes what you do and wants to help you get it out into the world or wants to buy it and have you sign your book or whatever, ultimately you still, all your attention has to be within yourself, where your stories reside, where your curiosity resides. And it can't, there's just nothing outside of that for you to write about. And so it was, um, it actually came, it actually came from a story about a, an American, uh, a young American middle distance runner who was, someone described as running within himself. I used to be a runner also. And I knew what that meant where you kept your attention right in your body, on your stride, on your breathing. And it struck me with writing that you wanted to do the same thing. Keep your attention right there with yourself and never let it drift out to what people will think of it. If there's a market for it and blah, blah, blah. You really have to keep it. It's a, it's a, it is a, you know, another part of a spiritual practice is simply being present, not being in the past, not being in the future and not resisting the present moment, just being where you are. Mm. And that is what, and that's part of why writing feels so good when you actually get in the flow. Not only are you fearless, but you're actually present. You know, you can't write and be regretting the past or worrying about the future. You have to be present, and you have to not be judging and resisting the present. So it's a great feeling because you're where you are. You, your mind is where your body is, and it feels pretty good. Yeah, one of the landmark spiritual books for me was "Be Here Now" by Ram Das, which uh, was just oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was a revelation for me. It was it was uh, tremendous. Let me ask you about your editor in chief of Author Magazine. You mentioned earlier uh, the magazine. It was launched uh -huh. in two thousand eight, sponsored by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association. It's a it's an online magazine for writers. What is the yeah. um, objective of Author Magazine? What is your um, what what are the contents like? And what's your overall objective with it? My main objective was I wanted to, I kind of wanted to do with the magazine what I have gone on to do with my books, which was help the readers deal with the emotional challenges of writing. And part of how I would do that is I really wanted to interview writers and I wanted to interview them not um, on the page, but video interviews. I wanted my audience to see and hear them. So, and to get into just the emotional challenges of writing with these people so that the viewers could see themselves as being a part of a community and that these very often very experienced, very successful writers had the same fears, the same concerns that they did. And that was the case uh, almost from the get go. And so, you know, I was a writer myself. So I could just talk to them about what it is we go through when we're trying to do trying to do this thing. And that was my main goal, just create a kind of sense of community. We publish essays also about um, you know, about sometimes the craft, but usually the kind of writing life. And I have a column I do, I used to do it five days a week. Now I do it twice a week. Uh, yeah, twice a week. Uh, just whatever, I, whatever I'm whatever i interested thinking about, about writing these days or about the creative life in general. And so it's a kind of place to go to feel, to be reassured, to be uplifted, to get some inspiration, to be encouraged. I never publish anything that's sort of negative about the writing or publishing industry. I'm not interested in discouraging anybody. It's always trying to encourage and uplift and inform. So what um, you had mentioned, you know, Russell Baker, probably he was channeling his energies towards fiction, but it, it didn't really work for him because it wasn't right. where his creative expression really was. What do you say to the, I mean, when does a writer know that they're in the, 
Right. I, I mean, for instance, Anne Rice, I remember her saying that as soon as she thought of telling stories through vampires, everything clicked. It was like, boom, this, this yeah. is it. So it wasn't yeah. necessarily um, that she, it was within the, she knew she wanted to be in the fiction genre. It appealed to her, but she right. had to find the right channel. Same thing with, with uh, J.K. Rowling when she, she yep. said she had a physical reaction to it when all of a sudden she thought about the magical <laughs> yeah. boy, a little boy, yeah. and she knew yep. um, that this is it. So, yeah. uh, but what should a writer feel when they're actually, because uh, there's so many, you can be writing nonfiction, memoirs, autobiographies, sure. biographies, fiction, uh, autofiction, and so on. Uh, what should they be feeling when they know they've hit the vein? Well, it should be effortless, first of all. And I, I am the poster boy for this because I tried writing fiction for 20 years. And I always say that, you know, the kind of fiction I wrote, like I love to write. And the stories that I was writing were not so far afield from the kind of stuff in terms of thematically that I, I guess I do now. But it's like the, I'm a size 12 and fiction was like an 11 and a half. And I was just walking around in these shoes because I thought that's what you're supposed to wear. I never asked myself if you could write anything at all, what would it be? It just, I just intellectually said, well, it's got to be fiction. That's what I read when I was young. It didn't even occur to me that I could write personal essay, I could write these memoirs. And so you need to really, you, the, the slate has to be clean. It has to be absolutely anything. And if you're not sure, you can experiment, but it should turn you on. It should be exciting. It should feel effort, It should feel effortless in a way. You may have to, you know, Everything takes some work, and you don't find the stories right away. But the effort required to write something that you're not really that interested in writing and the ease of following something that you're authentically interested in should be pretty clear. And I'll tell you, it could, but it could be, you know, the good news is you will suffer and fail if you try to write something that you're not meant to. So that will be one of the clues uh, because, in a sense, you are rejecting yourself first by not writing what you should be writing, what you actually want to write. And if you're asking yourself what's publishable, that's the wrong question. And if you ask yourself what will make me look good, that's the wrong question. It's just what seems like the most interesting thing for me. And, it, and, and you have to ask it with no predetermined answer. And if you don't know the answer, then admit you don't and start experimenting to find out. Because I just I think if you can, that is the first question you absolutely have to answer in terms of uh, from a sort of practical level. Just what do I want to do? Is it poetry? Is it plays? Is it screenplays? Is it what is it? You know, because a lot of them are, there's a lot of overlap, but there's a subtle difference, and you should know it when you find it. But it will be difficult if it's not the right thing. And it would be way. satisfying. It would be satisfying. And it would be absolutely. And you should have a sense of you know it, what it is. That was the weird thing with me in personal essay. I knew from the moment I finally let myself write some exactly what they should be and how they should begin and how they end. And I had no concept in my mind of why, how other people would write them. I wasn't even interested in how other people wrote them. Uh, but I was always thinking about how other people wrote fiction because I had no sense of what I actually wanted it to be for myself. I had no image of what a satisfying novel was weirdly even though i've read plenty i when i sat down to write i had no image of what that was as soon as i wrote an essay i knew as mm. soon as i wrote one and you know and but you know what the funny thing is mike the time i did that i was writing fiction at the same time so i was editing the magazine and writing these essays and i, I still even though i wrote my first essay I thought man wow that feels good that feels easy I still wouldn't let myself switch for years. I kept trying because I had such a image of myself as a novelist mm -hmm. and what I thought that meant that I couldn't let it go until I, it finally became so painful I just had to. I get it. I get it. What yeah. about the writing regimen? I mean, when you talk to writers, let's say, you know, a new, an aspiring author, um, what do you say in terms of how much daily effort or how frequently they really need to write or what kind of time they need to put into it so that they are actually not only producing copy, but maybe setting themselves up so that they can achieve a flow state. Yeah. I, you know, I think that when I, I do coach writers one-on-one, -on -one and I, I say, if you can do an hour a day, you know, if you, if you can only do a half an hour, okay, but 
it's going to take you 15 minutes to get warmed up, you know, probably. So at least an hour. And if you do two, that's great. I do, I do recommend, see, the thing about writing is that we're three, five sensory, three-dimensional beings like you and I. And we relate to the world physically. We relate to the world through our five senses. We react to stuff. We hear stuff. We touch stuff. We smell stuff. And that's a constant conversation we're having with the physical world. And all the other arts, we use our five senses to relate to something. I play music, so sometimes when I, I use my fingers and my voice and whatnot. whatnot. So but then you sit down to write, and there's nothing to relate to. Unlike the rest of your life, you have to go entirely within. And that is different than how you spend almost all your day. So you must accept that you're having to shift a way of focusing. It's like reading in a way, but it's a little different because you have to find a story, whereas the story is provided for you in a book. Um, and so, and I think it's it, the shift from what I call the domestic frame of mind to the writing frame of mind is not automatic and it requires practice. And I think that something Pavlovian kicks in if you can set a time and a place. It helps, I think. It's not a magic pill, but it helps to say I'm going to be like I'm in front of my desk at 6:20 a.m. every day. Like, there are five days, you know, six days a Tom, week, right? you remind me of what Tom Robbins said. He he says I I my muse knows where to find me. I'm not at the bar. I'm not at the beach. I'm not at the cafe. Right. I'm in my right. writing room at my desk. She knows right where to find me. <laughs> that's right. And, and I do think there's something to that because I do think it helps train you that that's what you're doing at that time. It's good. It's not magic. It doesn't work for everybody. But I think that it's important. And also, I think it's important for someone because probably if your listeners are writers who are starting out, they have a life. They got a job, probably. They got a relationship. They have all these things that call for their attention. And this thing, this writing, they can always not do it. And like they don't lose their job and their dinners will still get cooked and their relationships still continue. Like there's no reason you have to do it theoretically, mm -hmm. but you have to treat it like a job. I always did. Well, for me, it was like, do this or kill myself. So I, I feel like I didn't really have a choice. So that was, but it's a little dramatic, but that was how I viewed it. But I do think if you don't, if, even if you're not that extreme, you should treat it like a job and let your loved ones know when I close that door, don't come knocking unless the house is burning down. <laughs> I love you. I love you, but this is not about you. And I just, it, I, this has to be my time, and that's the end of it, full stop. And so that takes practice, and you have to get used to doing this thing, even though you don't know where it's going or how much money you're going to make or if it'll sell. There's all this unknown, but you know you like it, and that has to be enough. And if you know you like it and then that's enough, then you can, then you can begin to practice, and it'll take you somewhere, wherever that is. Yeah. Now, you teach classes in memoir and marketing for writers, uh, narrative arcs, uh, right? Yeah. What, what we were talking about earlier, writing as a spiritual practice. Sure. You sure. are also editor in chief of Author Magazine. You have lots to do, Bill, but what are you oh, working yeah. on next, uh, just in terms of a uh, book? So, I, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's a, new, it's a memoir y kind of thing about my relationship to Dungeons and Dragons. That's all I'm going to say about it. That's all I say. I've learned. I, if I say too much about books before I finish them, it, it, it gums up the works. Yeah. So I'm working on that thing. I'm good. I'm doing a lot of teaching. I'm going to be in Alaska this weekend. Actually, so the, my third book is Everyone Has What It Takes, um, which was that's also a kind of memoir because it was based partly on my relationship to my son who was on the autism spectrum. And he taught me a lot about writing. Here's something for your listeners. Mm hmm. Uh, that comes from this book, which is, I think, if any of them go to writers' conferences, the best advice I can talk to them about spiritual practice, in a way, my real spiritual, I mean, I, I, my second spiritual practice, let's say, because the first one really was writing, but the second one was raising a kid on the spectrum. And the thing I had to do with a kid on the spectrum is uh, there's a temptation to try to fix these kids, you know, because they do some strange stuff and you don't know how they're going to succeed if they do what they're doing. And of course, we tried to fix our kid at first and it didn't work. And I understood that it was a misperception to see him as broken just because he was doing these certain things. But the only way I could learn to not see him as broken is if I didn't see anyone as broken. 
because there was some stuff he did that was pretty odd, and I just didn't know how it was going to come out. And so I began to practice. I couldn't see myself as broken because I hadn't published anything, or my dad was broken because of some of the weird stuff he did when I was young, or the politicians I didn't like, or the people on the street. So I started seeing a world without broken people because no one is broken, not anyone, anywhere, ever. I'd written a piece about that for the New York Times. No one is broken, what my son taught me. But then I started applying it to writing because writers who think they don't have what it takes, who don't think they have talent, that's a broken writer. And I learned that the way I know I have what it takes and you have what it takes and anybody who likes to write has what it takes is because everyone does. Everyone has what it takes. No one is broken. So if they go to a conference and they're walking through the hall, they pass new writers, they pass the agents, they pass best-selling writers, they always should think this. No one's better than me. No one's worse than me. No one's better than me. No one's worse than me. I don't like the word talent. I don't like the word genius. I don't like to say this one's so good and this one's a mid-lister. I don't like dividing us into creative have and have-nots. No such thing. Everybody's got what it takes. Just no one's better. No one's worse. No one's better. No one's worse. I think it's a great practice to just let it be a mantra as you walk through the bookstore, as you meet writers, as you meet agents. No one's better than me. No one's worse than me. No one's better than me. Because we compare ourselves, Mike, writers and artists and decent, loving, tender people who constantly rank and compare themselves. Right. And it does us no good. It does us no good. Best-selling list. I don't like awards. I mean, I think they help people's careers. I just interviewed a woman who won the National Book Award, and we were just talking about, like, yeah, it helped her, but awards stink <laughs> because they're so <laughs> false. They're so you, you can't measure. You can't. You can't. You can't. Nobody knows who's the best. Who's the worst. There's no such thing. And so let that let that be a mantra for your listeners. So and everyone has what it takes. You've given us a light sketch of what you're working on now. And uh, yeah. I want to ask you if you already know what you're going to write after that. And I'll tell you. No, what. no I don't. You don't? Okay. No, I don't. And the reason no. I ask that question is because I think, and I, I've had this experience myself, and I'm sure it's not unusual, is that you you have a... I know I, I'm writing something, but I know what I want to write after that. And any time uh -huh. I'm having difficulty with the project I'm working on, my mind drifts to that other project thinking maybe that's right. the one I should be on. Maybe that right. one I feel like right. I've got I've got more of a of a of a, a sense of that, a more of a rapport already with that. Maybe I should just abandon right. this one and go on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. The mind plays oh, tricks. Yeah. The mind plays tricks on Well us. hey, that's a good point. So listen, this is something I talk to my students and clients about. The rubber hits a road, hits the road for the writer. When they reach the end of a sentence, a scene, paragraph, and they don't know what comes next, what do you do at that moment? And I used to fear that moment. I used to think I'd get I'd like a stopwatch would start running. Tick, tick, tick. Come on, Bill. Come on. Where's, where's the idea? Come on. Come on. I'd sit there for five minutes, ten minutes, fine. But if it went beyond that, I'd start getting a little antsy. And I'd start feeling like there's something wrong with me. I haven't got anything, blah, 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 blah. But I think that's a key moment. And you have to know, you have to be patient with yourself. And you have to sit there and I've gotten to the point now where I almost love those moments more than when the writing is coming. You know why? Because if I'm sitting there, see, it's easy to feel the connection. Let's call her the muse. To hear the muse talking when the words are coming, right? That's easy to feel the connection then. The thing you're plugging into the, where the ideas come from. It's different when the words aren't coming. But I've learned that when I reach the end of a sentence and I can feel that I want to say something, I feel that something else is coming, but I don't know what it is yet. And all the ideas I'm getting so far aren't the right ones, but I can feel the right one is coming. And if I get real still and I don't judge myself, which I don't anymore, and just sit there and wait, I can feel the connection even though the words aren't coming. And that is so satisfying and so reassuring to know I don't have to be producing, just have the connection be there. It's just a matter of waiting and seeing the scene correctly, and then the thing will come. And I've come to love that, the stillness of waiting for the right idea, for the next right thing. The stillness that of waiting. That is critical. Yeah, that, that's, oh, that's kind of meditative it. again, that stillness of waiting. It is. Yeah. Your mind goes blank. But here's the thing. You can, is the feeling, like I got nothing, I got nothing. It's never true. You have the feeling of what came before and what, and, and you can feel what wants to come next. You just don't know what it is. That's okay. If you have the feeling of the wanting to come next, you have something. Own that and then let it see what it wants to become and allow it to be whatever. Um, and 
sit with that feeling. And I and I've gotten. I'll tell you, it, it, it was a kind of a triumph when I learned that I could sit and wait and not freak out. And sometimes I have to wait thirty minutes. That was okay. I was okay with that because I knew it was going to come, and I liked the feeling of the thing that was going to come. And that was, I was good just sitting with that. Mm-hmm. So I do think it's really important that you develop the patience. When you reach the a moment where you don't know what's next and you get interested in that and get interested in how the idea comes instead of just jumping to something else. It's not the worst thing to jump to something else because then you'll jump back. But I do think it's important at some point to learn what to do when the words aren't coming and not be freaked out by that. Right. Our guest has been Bill Knauer. He is the author of Fearless Writing. He's an advocate for fearless writing. I have put his uh, the URL to his website in the episode notes. You can go there, see all of his books, all the classes that he teaches. Uh, also, he is editor-in-chief of Author Magazine. Uh, Bill, this has been an interesting discussion and wide-ranging discussion. Thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure.